I'm here today with Bella O'Neill, pro-life advocate and former intern for Justice for All. Bella, welcome to Brave New Us. Thank you for having me. So I would say most people at this time in their lives are making plans to go off to college and start their careers. Why did you choose to do this work with your time? Yeah, it kind of, it was a little bit wild. It was definitely Providence. Um, uh, right after my senior year or like the couple months before graduation, I was like filled with so much anxiety. I was like, God, what do you want me to do for my life? I just, I have no idea. Um, Cause that senior year was the first year um, in an entirely new state. I grew up in California, then moved to Idaho for my last year of high school. For my former plans, I was going to go to San Diego State, like my parents, and I had it all planned out. I was going to get an English degree. Um, and now things are very different. And I hadn't given a lot of thought of where do I want to be for the next four years if I want to go to college? Do I want to go to college? What kind of career do I want? Do I want a career? So all these big questions were kind of left unanswered. And by the, the last few months before graduation, I was sort of, you know, hammering down and procrastinating like, okay, this is it. This is like the big year. I got to figure out my life right now at 18 years old. Um, and I, I didn't really know. I get, I was like, I guess I could go to the state school here or the community college here, but like what, for what, like, what would, what do I want out of life? What do I want out of college? Um, and around that time, a really good friend of mine, um, was committed to go to Thomas Aquinas college in Santa Paula. And I was like, yes, I like, that's it. That's it. I would get a liberal arts degree from the great books, philosophy, theology, a wonderful community. That's where I know God wants me there. Um, so he's going to figure everything out and I'm going to get there. Um, so excited. I was accepted. Um, I could just see it all like romanticize the next four years of my life. Um, and then my financial aid fell through and I wasn't able to go. And it was so devastating. I was like, great God. I totally thought you were like this. You gave your green light and this is where I was meant to be. How could it not be? Um, and so I, I'm very, very sad, but everyone was telling me, you know, maybe you just need to let go of TAC. Maybe you just need to let go of this perfect idea in your head of what the next four years will look like and really just go empty handed to God. Let him surprise you. So I went to adoration and I was very sad and I began a novena. I cannot remember the novena, um, but I guess it must've been on day four or five and I was just praying and like my ongoing prayer was like, listen, I'm in this mess and I have no idea how to get out of it. So you have to figure that out. Like I can't. So you figured out it's your problem now. Um, and then the next day, my mom comes into my room and she's like, hey, um, our good friend, um, Laura and Trent Horn reached out and they said that um, there's an internship at a pro-life organization that Trent Horn used to work at. Um, and Trent Horn worked for Catholic Answers and before he kicked off his career as a pro-life apologist and a Catholic apologist um, and his podcast he's doing, he, um, I think around 2010, he um, interned for JFA for, I, I think, one to two years. Um, and so he, he had met up with his former teammates at JFA for a pro-life conference and they were looking for interns and then his wife reached out to my mom and said do you think Bella would be interested in this you know just throwing it out there do you think she'd be interested and I had never even thought about missionary work like it never even crossed my mind my idea of a missionary was just very stereotypical and surface level I said that's just not for me mm -hmm. um but she brought it up and my first thought was, no, that's just not TAC. So it's just not down my alley because it doesn't look like what I want. Um, but then I looked into it and it actually was really intriguing to me. Like I, I looked at the website and it was about pro-life advocacy. Um, and I had always been passionately pro-life. I'd always, I'm a very outspoken person. So if there were people that disagreed with me, I was all ears and all mouth to talk about it. <laughs> I could talk about it forever. I could defend my beliefs um, or bulldoze more like. And uh, so I'd always been passionately pro-life. And, but in recent years, I had 
kind of a lot of questions had been away in my heart when it comes to faith or politics or whatever it is. And it's always that like really sneaky question, why? But why am I pro-life? Why are the pro-choice people wrong? Why are they pro-choice? Why are they us versus them? And and why are we always screaming at each other? Why are we always disagreeing? And I had kind of like had this really undeveloped thought of maybe I need to lend people who disagree with me an ear, like actually listen to them instead of, you know, tell them the truth. I mean, like, you know, give them something like a hard pill to swallow. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of something I had been thinking about um, throughout my senior year. Um, but looking at the justice for all website that's all i saw and it was this really beautiful concept that they just had their tagline as love the woman and love the child and love the person you're disagreeing with equally Mm -hmm. i said like that's that's the thing i've been thinking about that that's the thing that's kind of been pricking at me and then that's when i was hooked i was like well what do they have to say how do they recommend talking about this like what what is their technique and their website, Justice for All, um, has so many incredible stories of the of witnessing the pro life message to people who you would think could never agree with them, and then they end up being a lot more open than than um, someone would think in the beginning, and so. Go, rummaging through the website, rummaging through their mission statements, hearing all this stuff about, you know, changing um, their goals to make abortion so unthinkable, like so many other injustices, one person at a time, to change a thousand minds and hearts, just one person at a time. And I thought like, that's such a beautiful way to encounter this massive problem. Because the devil likes to make us feel overwhelmed, like the, the like everything's on us, that we need to solve this huge epidemic of abortion all at once, when really, how did Jesus meet people one by one? How did he heal people? By touching them and listening them, l- listening to them, laying his hands on them, hearing them. Like he was interactive. He was not someone that looked at the masses, told them what to do and left. He was involved. And so their whole mission statement, the way that they approached the pro-life message was very intriguing to me. And I was like, huh, maybe I am interested. And maybe this is a really educational opportunity for me as well. I have a lot to learn here. I I think I know everything I'm talking about, but maybe I'm wrong. So I looked into their internship and their um based in Wichita, Kansas. And I thought, oh, that's kind of an adventure. Maybe I could move to Wichita and just, you know, delve into this community that could teach me so much on how to be not only a pro-life advocate, but really a, like, um, um, an ambassador for Christ. Like, what does it mean to, like, change hearts? What is this heart problem that's going on? Because there's something so much deeper that we're fighting. Um, And so I was very intrigued. And then things just started falling into place. And it was a stark contrast between my my, um, wanting to go to TAC when there were so many like red lights. And it was so hard to this opening of justice for all. And it was like doors just opened and fell into place. And then before I knew it, August of 21, I was in Wichita, Kansas as an intern. Wow. So what did a typical campus visit look like for you? It it really depended on the college campus for at least the response that we would get. But usually it was about um, if we got in for like a three day um, outreach, we would get in about two or three days before outreach. We would stay at host homes. Um, we would have a couple of our seminars or workshops, and then we'd go out on campus for two to three days, um, get there really early in the morning, set up our whole exhibit um, around 8 a.m., and then by 9, our exhibit's fully put up, and we would sit out there until for about six hours and just dialogue with college students the entire time. And then around 3, we'd take down our exhibit, and then around 4-ish, we'd... Um, head to either another workshop or back to our host homes. But that's usually the structure of it. Um, What was a part of the exhibit? What did the exhibit look like? Yeah. So something really 
interesting about JFA is this idea of common ground without compromise. So how they deliver the truth, they, they never water it down. You'll never find them making compromises on the, the dignity of life or the evils of abortion, but they're not very flashy. So you don't see like big signs saying that you, you have to be pro-life or you're burning hell or nothing that would like enrage somebody in that way. Instead, they would have like a huge board um, and it would just have um, life from conception to nine months. And they would have pictures, they would have facts, they would quote um, pro-choice doctors and pro-life doctors on just basic human development. And they would scatter that across this really well um, composed uh, board. And then they would have different like sandwich boards encircling the exhibit with different like testimonies. There is this letter that this um, young man wrote to his daughter who was aborted um, against his will. Um, and he just wrote about how much he had wanted to see her and how this wasn't his wish for her. And then there was another sandwich board with someone with Down syndrome and a Down syndrome st statistic. Um, and then various other boards that kind of had like open-ended questions. When do you think life begins? Do, um, is it evil for this to happen? Um, I, I have a brochure here, but we would have a lot of sandwich boards with um, kind of a silhouette of a pregnant woman. And then kind of, then we'd have sandwich boards with Justice for All's mission, kindling affection for the forgotten, beginning with women in distress, the smallest humans on earth, and those who differ in appearance or beliefs. Mm -hmm. So if you just approached and you just kind of like looked around, nothing would shout at you that we were pro-life. We would have a um, free speech board as well, which got a lot of people to come and share their opinions. So on the opposite side of the board with the human development would, would be the free speech board. And then we had a poll table. And this is kind of where a lot of people were initially drawn in. Like, do you think um, abortion should be legal? Do you think that tax dollars should be um, used for abortion? Whatever the question was, it would be used on the poll table and someone would write their name, yes or no. Um, and then that's kind of where a discussion will begin. Um, but it's interesting because there have been times where there would be predominantly women on a certain trip or the men wouldn't be there at that moment. And there would be a lot of uh, the college students that would come really excited. We're like, oh, what are you guys doing? And then we'd say, we're a pro-life organization. And immediately they'd go, oh, I didn't think you guys were pro-life because the exhibit wasn't targeted to like make people's blood boil, but it was definitely like the truth displayed so that you can come and discuss. Right. So what kind of training did you go through before getting there and having these conversations? So initially we had to go through um, JFA's like six, five, six hour um, seminar as students. We went through that seminar. We have um, a workbook and we just worked through it. Um, and then we had as interns a like about 60 different assignments we have to do. And these assignments were like research assignments. Um, so something could be like, what when does life begin? And then you'd, you'd study an article about really what is life? When does it begin? Um, uh, the, the bare bones of conception. Other um, articles would be, um, is brain dead dead? Or if you're um, offered this question about an infant that's born without a brain like what would you say here and so there was a lot of like heavy informational things mm -hmm. um that we kind of researched through the assignments but on the opposite end a lot of it was um from like peer mentoring um on the team so we went through the seminar we um then we just were thrown out on campus so it was more like a learn as you go. And um, after every outreach, we would have a debrief with the team. And as inter interns, we had like a million first questions, a million like, I was in this situation and I said this and they responded like that and I didn't know what to say. Um, and so with that bare bones of, we had our informational research mm -hmm. assignments, we went through the seminar, um, but then really all the learning was being like just going through it, learning as you go, hearing all of the wisdom from the other team members. Um, 
so that was probably the training um, that we went through. How did the conversations usually go? Oh my goodness. The, this is like the fun part. This is the part where I, it's interesting because it was always, you, you never knew. You never knew what kind of a conversation you were getting into. You never, you never know what could be behind somebody. Um, so in that way, it was kind of terrifying. And it was also like really exciting. Um, Cause you don't know if you're going to have a three hour conversation where you hear this person's entire life story and they shed tears in front of you and, and tell you their deepest, darkest secrets. And then they listen to your heart on the pro-life message and they change their mind, which has happened. Or you don't know if you're going to have a 10 minute conversation where they scream vulgar things that you tell you to go, you know, to a lot of different places and then walk away. And so I would say in the, in, in the beginning, I never really felt that extreme. If anything, um, you never get the best and the worst all the time. Usually, um, you know, someone would come up to the the poll table and be like, hi, how are you? Um, what are your thoughts on abortion? Do you have time to share? Um, and they'd say, you know, for example, oh, you know, I haven't, I haven't really thought about it, but I, I was always just raised pro-choice and I think that's that's pretty reasonable. Like I think I think women should have, you know, the choice to choose what they want for their life. And then you would go through the basic JFA training, which is to keep these three essential skills. One being ask questions with an open heart, listen to understand, and find common ground whenever possible. These are like the ship that you take information without this ship sailing your information is going to sink and never be taken to its destination um and so with those um techniques and like honestly those postures of heart you start to see these people as someone you need to understand and instead of like i need to make sure i i tell them all these these facts and what if they disagree and so they'd say, you know, I think I'm pro-choice. And you're like, okay, by pro-choice, do you mean you believe abortion should be illegal or legal? Oh, I think abortion should be legal. Do you think it should be legal up until nine months? Or do, is there a cutoff? Oh, I think, I I don't think abortion should be legal after like, I guess the baby, I guess the baby can like have a heartbeat. Okay, so you disagree with abortion and you think it should be illegal after six weeks. That's when a heartbeat is? Mm. Oh, yeah. Would you like to see our pamphlet? Yeah, I, I, I guess. And we show them um, this pamphlet. This brochure is like such a beautiful tool, but it has all the different, I don't know if it's going to even come uh. up, all the different stages. Um, and I would just like, sometimes you would even bring up to them and say, can you point where you think abortion should be legal? Mm -hmm. And so I would show them, this is where the heartbeat begins. They're like, wow, you, you can see fingers. I'm like, yeah. Now, and I'm being honest. I'm like, they don't think they can't like, you know, um, process things. It's not like the mom will be able to feel them, but what do you, who do you think that is? And then that would open a, a huge discussion of, when do you think human life starts? When do you think we are valuable? What makes us valuable? Um, why do you think that at six weeks they are human and not before? Um, and so usually a standard conversation um, would just be a lot of those kind of questions. And then you would kind of bring them through challenging thought experiments um, where whether it's you know trotting out a toddler or um, an equal rights argument, um, but all the while you're finding common ground. I agree. Abortion should be illegal after six weeks. Um, I, I believe that, you know, humans have rights because we are human. What do you think about that? What gives us rights? Um, so the average conversation, if the, if they aren't necessarily, um, hostile would actually be really good faith. And, and you would be surprised how much people will listen when they feel heard. Um, and that's usually the standard. Um, and, and I mean, by standard, it, it's hard to stay, say standard because every single person is so individual with such an individual story. And usually a really good conversation would be an hour to two hours. You'd hear about their background, their worldview, where that came from, 
their pains in life, what wounds led them to be pro-choice. Um, but a lot of the time it ends on a very good note. Like, a, I'll think about that. You, you gave me something to think about at least. Uh, on, on the flip side of that, I understand that there were some campuses that were maybe a little bit more challenging and that there were some people who could be, be, as you said, a little bit aggressive and, and maybe even an element of the demonic coming out in these situations. Could you describe some of the hostility that you faced? Yeah. Um, when you say that, it, like one school just immediately comes to mind, <laughs> um, for the most part, my two semesters with JFA were really, were not aggressive. Like we had aggressive people and, and from a varying degree of colleges of really, really open to the message and really, really against most were like right here. You'd have a flood of people every now and then that were particularly disruptive, not open. For, but, but for the most part, um, the conversations were good. One school, however, left a huge impact on me to the point where I was so terrified to go back in the spring. They really gave our team a really hard time. And that was kind of the first time I was met with that kind of an aggression so personally. Um, and it, it's kind of like the worst case scenario. Like whenever you ask somebody, oh, why don't you have conversations about your faith, about politics, about abortion? they usually bring to mind the worst case scenario and it's, they're going to scream at me. They're going to call me names. They're, they're going to put me in a corner and they're not going to listen to me. And it's just going to be hopeless. And then they're going to attack me. And then that, that fear of the feeling of being attacked and on the defense comes up. And I mean, I had that fear like anyone else, but being with JFA for a few months, I, that, that fear definitely dies down. Confrontational fear kind of dies down. Um, Cause you, you know what to expect. And this school was like that worst case scenario. Um, and so we're, we're on campus. We are, we're going through our normal, normal exhibit. I start the morning with a couple, you know, standard conversations. They were more short, but just, it's just normal. Um, and then a group of girls, I would say about three come screaming and shrieking and saying the most vulgar things going around targeting each of us, like filming. Um, yeah, saying things that just like, you don't even want to repeat. Like they were just so personal and so crude. About you personally? Yeah. yeah, about us. It could be about the way we look, about they were calling us inbred Mormons. It was just like the weirdest stuff. We were like, where's this coming from? And then they would attack what we were saying. Like, oh, wow, you think that a nine-year-old raped up by their father should be forced to have a baby. And I would just go into normal, like, okay, I'm going to talk about this. And I would say, you know, rape is like the most horrible crime I can think of against somebody. And I'm a hundred percent against rape interrupted. Oh, everyone's against rape. Answer the question. Mm -hmm. Like not open for dialogue, not open to hear us out. And they were just screaming. Um, that was really hard. And it was hard to see like that kind of hostility and evil being spewed at the teammates that you love. The teammates who you know are some of the kindest people on earth. The JFA team has some of the strongest, wisest, beautiful souls. And they're they're out there and they'll listen to about any anything. If you come to, come to them and talk to them about anything, they will hear you out and hear all the reasons why you are pro-abortion, all the reasons why you're this or that they don't listen. And that's just the beauty of JFA. But these people who are so open-hearted and loving, like seeing them face this kind of fire, that was so hard. Um, and so part of me was like, be, be gracious, be compassionate. And the other part of me was like, I'm going to stand up for my friends. Like they can't talk to us like that. And so there's these weird, like things that warn you. And of course, this overarching fear of hatred, fear of persecution, fear of you know, I don't really care what they think about me, but really I do. Like for some reason being hated by these people really affects me. Um, and so it was difficult. We couldn't really dialogue with them. They wouldn't let us. Um, we, we would film them before they like tried to obscure any of our um, exhibit. Um, 
we weren't going to interfere, just film. And we told them, we'll call the police. If you hurt our stuff, you're welcome to be around the exhibit, but you can't hurt us or our things. Did it ever uh, get physical? No, not at all. And I mean, I think they kicked a sign once and we told them, if you do that again, we'll call campus security. They mocked us and they were like, oh, the campus security should take you guys out of here. But they didn't do anything um, dangerous, but it was hard. They made a very dangerous and hostile environment. Um, there was a time where my um, uh, teammate, Christina, and I were trying to dialogue with them. And we were sitting on these little chairs and we were surrounded by a crowd of just like pro-choice people who were sneering and screeching and saying really profane things about babies about, you know, Jesus, whatever it could be about us, just vulgar. Um, and there was about one or two girls that were kind of talking with us. Um, they brought up the hardest topics, the topics in the pro-life um, um, discussion that need the most care, sensitivity, and attention, even when argue, arguing that abortion is never right in any circumstance. When you're talking about rape, incest, sexual abuse, um, life of the mother. These are not things that you just say, well, you shouldn't have an abortion. It's evil. You're killing a baby. You, you want to carry these with such sensitivity, especially when you're talking to somebody when you don't know their story. And so we, we were trying to do that. We were trying to not only represent the truth, but also meet, like give it with that graciousness. Um, and they weren't complying with that. Anytime we tried to find common ground, they just sneered at us. Anytime we tried to tell them, you know, that abortion harms women further, they sneered at us. Um, so they were not in a posture of receiving anything. Um, so we sat there and we just listened. And this um, young woman from like the, the front of this huge crowd, like pointed finger at us and screamed at us saying that she was raped when she was 16, mm -hmm. that she has come into contact with very evil people that tried to use her and what would happen if she had a baby do you think that this college student that her life should be taken from her and she just you know kind of like lectured at us all the reasons why our point of view is harming women why we're taking away their rights why all these white men and uh, on our team are just oppressing us further and many of us told us they felt bad for us because we had been brainwashed and so when you're met with that, part of you feels like I want to run away as soon as possible. But then once you're met with that worst case scenario, you start to see it for what it really is. And when this young woman told us that she'd been raped, my first thought was this poor girl. What do I expect from her to look at me and say, you're right, Bella. I was wrong. I'm going to walk away and pretend like I don't have baggage. No, she has wounds in her heart that I can't just explain away. So what am I going to do right now? Maybe I won't be able to plant a seed, but I'll be able to till some soil. Maybe I won't be able to, you know, break through her rocky ground, but I can start. Maybe I won't be the person that converts her because really no one does. That's the Holy Spirit. But I'll just be here to listen. I'll show her that not all pro-life people are out to get her. And so that's kind of where the day shifted. In the, in the morning, my heart was like, well, you know, they can't talk to us like this. And, you know, we're right. And how do I tell them that? And they're so evil. You know, they're so mean. And then my heart just completely shifted. And when I saw these girls screaming on my face, saying the most vulgar things, it's like my fear went away. And I just felt so hurt for them. And then that's kind of when I took a step back and thought, that's not my job anymore. And the Holy Spirit will be with them. That didn't mean, mean it made it easy. Like I tried to have other conversations with people and, and those particular girls would interrupt, get really close to my face, scream in my face. At one point, they really targeted one of my other teammates, the most like precious young woman in the world. They really targeted her. Um, they were so close to her that she like raised her hands to be like, please step away. Lightly like touched their finger. And then the girls were like, you touched me. Like I'll, I'll sue, like, you know, threatening um, her and she's like listen I'm just saying you were close to me um and so at one point that teammate and I took a break um and I was like crying just like my nervous system was overloaded yeah, I bet. Crying, just crying with her um 
but that's the other beauty of the JFA team is like, you're not in this spiritual battle. You're not in the abortion movement alone. You have warriors beside you. Um, and she was such like a stronghold for me. We cried a bit. We took some deep breaths and we were like, let's go get lunch. Mm-hmm. And those girls followed us. They taunted us. Oh, we made her cry. You know, all that petty stuff. But at that point, I'm like, I'm going to eat my chicken nuggets and I'm just going to take a break. Um, but then again, and, and my thought, like during all of that, while I was texting my mom, like, please pray. I don't know what's going on. Like my thought was, how am I going to come back tomorrow? How am I going to look at them tomorrow? I have just felt so weak and powerless. But then the next day we showed up and then it was easier because, you know, your heart changes. You realize there's so much good happening here. These few girls that are really bringing such destruction and hostility, they're just a few. The amount of amazing conversations and um, changing hearts on that campus were far greater than the hostility we were met with. And when we came back on that campus again with our exhibit and we stood strong, it felt so much better to say that we're there and we're bringing the truth with love Mm -hmm. and we aren't doing anything wrong. And we're going to wait until their hearts are softened. We're going to wait for them. Um, But that was probably the most aggressive encounter that I experienced at my time there. Wow. Well, so can you share some of those those really good conversations? Do you have any memories that stand out as your wins? Yeah, there's a few that come to mind. Um, I was at Tarleton um, University in Stephenville, Texas, and we set up our exhibit. And, and this is one of those campuses that are far more, um, I guess you could say conservative. And so the, the, the even the people there that said they were pro-choice were more conservative pro-choice um, people who didn't agree with abortion um, after this many months. And so that was kind of grounds that was a lot more calm. Um, and I, I was standing around an exhibit and I saw this young woman walking past and I just was like, Hey, would you like to stop by and um, sign our poll? And she just stopped. She was like, um, what's the poll about? I was like, Oh, we're, we're taking a poll on whether abortion should be legal or not. She goes, Oh, I don't really think I've asked myself that question before. Hmm. It's like, Oh, well, if you'd like to talk, um, I'd love to listen and we can look through the brochure and, um, I mean, I can only give you the information I have, but if you want to talk about it, I'm here. She goes, yeah, actually, I love that. She sat down with like her lunch or something, and I just showed her the brochure, and I walked her through the basic science. I was like, this is when the sperm meets the egg, and then implantation, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and the baby is born. And then I told her what abortion does. I told her the different kinds of abortion, and then I told her, this is why I'm against abortion. I believe it takes the right to life from a human being with value. I believe that a human being with value begins from the moment of conception. What do you think? And I I made her like rest assured, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm not here to like, like persuade you. I genuinely, you're getting all this for the first time. So what do you think? She's like, yeah, I don't know. I've really heard a lot of points of view. I, I was kind of, I was raised Christian but I'm not anymore really, because I was really hurt by the people at my church. Um, my mom, I think, I don't actually know what she thinks about abortion. I've just heard a lot of people say that, you know, I guess it gives women rights. You know, some women are in really hard circumstances. And I related with her. I said, I agree. Some women are in like really unimaginable circumstances. Like I can't imagine a woman being in a state of poverty not having someone to support her there and finding she out she's pregnant. I can't imagine like that pit in your stomach when you realize I can barely care for myself. How am I going to take care of a baby? And she we, she just kind of nodded her head and she's like, yeah, so I don't know. I, I guess I just have a hard time with it that if abortion could alleviate that, why is it bad? And she wanted to hear what I had to say. I said, you know, like I said, I, I've never even been in that situation. I don't even know what that woman could be feeling, but this is kind of how I think about the situation. Let's say 
there's a woman um, that I just described. Let's say maybe she was sexually abused and she's poor. She's barely getting by. She doesn't, she's paycheck to paycheck to various different jobs, very unstable. And she finds out she's pregnant. Her first thought is, like I said, I can't even take care of myself. I'm going to ruin this baby's life. I don't, I don't, how could I be a mother? I, I'm not even going to think about becoming a mother because it can't happen. Let's say she's like 10 weeks along and she decides to have an abortion. Many people would say that's justified. She's, she's looking out for herself. And honestly, probably she's looking out for that future kid because what kind of life would he have? Now imagine a woman in the same circumstance, but she's six months pregnant. Let's say that, you know, like I said, poverty, barely getting by, but maybe she had a, a partner and he maybe wasn't the most supportive, but he was there and maybe he was contributing to the rent just a bit. Um, and here she is six months pregnant and she decides, okay, I'm going to keep this baby. We'll see what happens, but I'm going to keep the baby. She goes, continues with the pregnancy and she has her baby, but at this time, the partner dumps her, leaves, and is gone. Now she's not having that rent. She's not able to have his contribution. She's not able to like rely on him in any way. And she's all alone with a baby in poverty, barely getting by. Her first thought is, how am I going to do this? I can barely care for myself. What makes me think I can care for a newborn baby or a child? This child's going to grow. How am I going to give it the life it deserves? And I laid this all out to her. And then I asked her, I know this sounds crazy, but bear with me. Do you think it's justifiable? Like it was justifiable for this other scenario, the same woman, six weeks pregnant to have an abortion, same circumstance. Do you think it's justifiable for her now, for a newborn, to end the life of the newborn? And immediately the girl goes, of course not, of course not. That's a newborn. You can't kill anybody like that. And I said, of course, and I would agree with you. I knew you would say that. I'm not calling you a murderer. But do you see why I made those comparisons there? She kind of thought about it and she goes, well, a newborn is not a six week old embryo. And I said, you're right. It's a different developmental stage. But what I'm trying to say is that there's a reason why we can't kill the newborn. Why is it that we can't kill the newborn? She goes, well, a newborn, a newborn can feel things. The newborn can breathe. I mean, you can, the, the newborn's like, right? Like, it's just a baby. Like you can, no one would hurt a baby. I told her, I agree with you. I'm not saying we should kill the baby. I agree that it's breathing and we shouldn't stop the breathing. I agree that you can touch it and feel it and hold it. And it's something you should protect. But animals breathe. And I'm assuming that you're not a vegetarian, but we kill animals humanely, but we eat them. Do you think that breathing is the reason why we can't kill this newborn? She thought about it. She said, no, I guess it's not breathing, but there's something more to the newborn it's like conscious and I said do you mean what do you mean by conscious do you mean that it's like experiencing the world like you and I she goes no I mean like it can think it can like remember its mom's voice it can it can hear things you know like it's experiencing the world I said I agree with you it's, it's experiencing, it's far more developed than a six-week-old embryo. But I'd like to make a similar argument that I just made, that dolphins are really intelligent. They experience the world around them. They are more smart than dogs. Do you think that dolphins have the same right to life as us? She goes, no. There's definitely a difference between dolphins and us. I said, then what is the reason why we don't kill newborns. What gives this newborn the right to life? She kind of was like, 
uh, I don't know, like, what do you think? <laughs> and this is the point where it's like, I know th the answer is something that no one's thinking of because it's so like, deeply ingrained in us. And the answer is, is that we're all human. When I look around and I see someone who's different skin color than me, different eye color, different socioeconomic status, different disabilities, abilities, I don't look at any of them and think, I have a more of a right to life to them because we're all human. And I asked her, I was like, do you, do you think that human is the best answer? I, I would say it's the best answer because that way there's no room to discriminate. Being human is the common denominator that gives us all that particular value to right, the, the particular value that gives us the right to life. I'm not saying we should treat animals inhumanely. I'm not saying that everything around us can be destroyed, but I'm saying there's something special about us. And that's that shared humanity. She goes, okay, no, I agree with you. I said, so when it comes to the abortion debate, I hear you when you say your heart goes out to women in poverty. I hear you when you say that you can't even imagine what it would be like considering to have a life altering event that is having a baby when you can barely get by. But I'm also emphasizing that I think that the most important question we have to ask ourselves within the abortion discussion is, is the embryo human? Because if that woman is pregnant with something that's not human, then I wouldn't care. If she has a parasite, take it out. If she has a tumor, take it out. I want her to be healthy. I want her to be safe. But the point of the abortion discussion is, does that embryo, does that fetus, does that unborn child have the same right to life as that newborn baby? Do you believe it's human? And she just paused. She goes, well, you were saying earlier that it's biologically human. How could something come from two human parents and not be human? So you're right. It is human. And it shouldn't be killed like the newborn. If, if we're basing our value off of we can't kill each other because we're human and we value each other because we're human, then no, I don't think abortion's all right. And I knew this was like a budding thing for her to say, but I was also like, what? <laughs> That's never happened to me before. <laughs> I've never like led someone to these thought experiments and had them be like, what? <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, I agree with you. And, and this is something that's shocking for me to think about too. Do you mind if I show you some abortion images? And she goes, yeah, yeah, I think I, I want to see those. And there's um, a page in the brochure that flips to various um, abortion victims. And it's from like six weeks um, and 12 weeks and a later pregnancy, I believe. And I show those to her and her face just like drops and she's very invested. She goes, that's wrong that's wrong and then the whole discussion went into an, another discussion about her life where she derives meaning where her faith is and we had this really beautiful discussion she goes you know when I was younger my I wasn't a planned pregnancy I came when my mom was moving from a really abusive relationship to my stepdad now she was not supported and she told me that the reason why she always come, calls me sunshine, because I was her gift in the darkness. Mm. I told her, you're right, you are. And she connected the dots and said, and I guess that's why abortion is wrong. Because what if those women were told that that baby could be their light in the darkness? Mm. I said, you're right. In the back of my head, I'm like, she's doing all the work for me. Like, this is not, I don't know what's happening right now. And then we had a really beautiful discussion about faith. And I talked, we talked about who hurt her from her past experiences in church and who God is. And I just told her, like, you have a purpose. Like, you're here for a reason. Just like your mom says that your sunshine, that identity was given to you by the maker of the sun. Like, you weren't just here for no reason. And that discussion was like three hours long. I got a sunburn and it, 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 <laughs> it was so good. And I walked away feeling like I don't even feel like I did anything. That was just one of those moments where if the girls at that aggressive campus, 
all I could do was like look at the rocky ground and like hit a shovel on it. I met this girl where I could just be the last little bit of water that she needed. And she just bloomed right in front of me because of who knows how many years that the Holy Spirit had been working and pouring into her. But that was one of like the most profound conversations I had on campus. Oh, that's incredible. I love that story. And I also love that she's the sunshine and you got a sunburn from your patients <laughs> like sitting there and talking to her. That's just yeah. the cherry on the top of the metaphor. <laughs> Um, so do you recall what it was like hearing of the Dobbs League for the first time? Were you still with the organization or had you already come home? Yeah, I was still with them. Um, we were a little bit afraid. We didn't know how this, and by we, I mean, I mean, I was a little afraid. I can't speak for everyone on, on the team, um, but I think we were all kind of related, like, how is this going to change discussions? And it definitely uh, this was kind of like the end of spring semester, I want to say, or maybe in the middle. I can't even remember. Um, I want to say this was like either March, February, April, something like that. Awesome. Um, something like that. And um, the leak came out and we thought it would get a lot more volatile. We definitely heard a lot about it because I was also working with them when the Texas bill um, was put out in um, that fall. And when we were in Texas, we definitely heard all about it. Um, that was um, something we had to study up on, a lot of correcting misconceptions, a lot of, you know, but it was a good conversation starter. With Can you the remind doc- listeners what the Texas heartbeat bill was? Yeah, so Texas put a ban, um, not necessarily a, yeah, a ban on abortions past six weeks. And if you they could sue whoever performed an abortion past six weeks. Um, That's like the the bare bones of it. Um, And so that came up in the fall and in the spring, it was the Dobbs leak. And it definitely didn't, it was brought up a lot. The impending decision was brought up a lot. There was a lot of hostility around that conversation, but all in all, I felt like campus was similar. It was the same. I do remember we went to UCLA um, in May of 22, and we were on campus at one of the the days where we thought the um, decision was going to be um, sent. And that was the day where I was like, this would be monumental if I was here during that time. And and then also would be like crazy because we're at UCLA Mm -hmm. and then that decision would come out. Um, And if it was in our favor, which we suspected, it would, who knows what would happen. It didn't happen at that time. But yeah, uh, I would say the atmosphere around abortion being legal was a little more tense. Like people kind of started to wake up about it a little bit more, um, slightly less indifference, um, but mostly the same. Mm -hmm. And what about when, um, when you really heard the news, it was actually. So I was, yeah, I wasn't um, working with JFA anymore at that point. Um, and I haven't really talked to any of my former teammates to see how that's kind of changed the campus, mm-hmm. um, but they're still having many um, outreach events and many conversations. So it sounds like it's not getting in the way, I think. Now, I'm going to switch perspective a little bit. What do you think that God was doing in your heart through this time of preparation? Oh my goodness. I like, that's a question that I'm like still reaping what was sowed. And it's something of, like, I'm very cleric. Like I'm very like, I want in my heart, I think I'm a fast processor. I feel like I just want to like, go, go, go. I want to like this season of my life happened. Let's wrap it up really neatly and move forward and learn our lessons really fast, really, really clean. And I think that like, God wants me to be far more melancholic than <laughs> I am to just like really take things and like live in them and like sit with them and have it build and build and build. And that's definitely what I feel like JFA has done in my heart. Like that, that whole experience being with JFA for that year, I was 18 and that fresh out of high school, um, very like, I'm going to go out there and and I'm going to learn and be great. I'm going to be an apologist. I'm going to change everyone's mind like very like I don't know if it would be egotistical as much as like 
uh, rosy cheeked and rose colored uh, uh, glasses. And, um, and then I think I was hit with like a lot of my own weaknesses. And with that, I was hit with like all the places where I want to grow. I think that's the biggest thing I learned in JFA was humility and humility is what opens up your heart and the people around you for change Mm -hmm. if I wasn't humble in my conversations with people they went badly if I wasn't patient in my conversations with people if I was short with people if I was too direct they went badly if I went into a conversation, guns a blazing, all the thoughts, all the stats, all the facts, bam, 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 bad. There was a certain kind of slowness I had to learn to have fruitful conversations. And they weren't like fruitful conversations weren't all my conversations. I had a lot of points where I was like humiliated when I was faced with what I did not know, humiliated when I was faced with my own pride. And so working with JFA really helped me refine those qualities um which is and then on top of that like reaping what I'm what was sown now it gave me this really beautiful foundation for listening all everyone who lives in in my house with me right now would laugh at me if I told them that I'm better at listening now because I have so much more to grow but it was just this this really beautiful opportunity to learn like my 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 teammate Christina had says it really beautifully like people will not listen until they feel heard people will not see the value of the unborn until they see the value of themselves and then I realized like I won't be able to see other people's value if I don't value myself either and so there's this really beautiful lesson about what it means to love and what it means to share the truth. Like love and truth are not contradictory. They go hand in hand. It's not like mercy and justice and they're separate and they like sometimes balance each other out. It's like they go together, go hand in hand. And so the same way that I would confront like aggression and hostility on campus is the way that I think I made it my goal to make that posture of my heart in my everyday life. If I can meet people in my everyday life with openness and listening and understanding, finding common ground with them, seeing them as the same as me, I'm going to grow so much more. I'm going to share the truth and they're going to receive it so deeply because they're not going to be afraid of me. And so I think the formation I was wanting so badly at Thomas Aquinas, the formation that I was like, this is going to make me an arsenal of knowledge and all this great stuff. I actually found what I really needed at JFA. Mm -hmm. Like the journey I was on, on the outside, the journey I was a part of, like the pro-life movement, that was amazing. But the journey in my heart was to be softened. And I, the art of listening is now something I hold as a priority. The art of loving and seeing people, like really seeing people, so far from it, but now it's my priority. So I definitely think God wanted that to be my foundation going into my adult life. That's beautiful. Um, What advice would you give to someone who's considering doing pro-life work or something similar to what you did post-graduation? Um, part of me wants to say like, just do it. Like you're going to love it. You're going to, but I I mean, I think I have a tendency to look at something and think this is an amazing learning opportunity and it's an adventure. And so I'm, I'm just going to go for it. But I think that although JFA was such a blessing, I only did it for a year because I realized I am not cut out for traveling so many times Mm -hmm. in a month. And, you know, I love outreach, but I don't think I am meant to do it so many times in a month. I think I meant for a slower paced routine. And so my my question to them would be, why do you want to go into pro-life work? Is it because you feel a call that God wants you to be a part of this movement right now? Or is it because you're passionately pro-life? 
is he calling you to like a grand scale, like students for life, justice for all? Is he calling you to travel? Is he calling you to speak? Or is he calling you to go down the street to your birth center, donate or volunteer? So I would say like, really listen to where, like pay attention to where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and then listen to where the Holy Spirit's calling you with those. Because if I had done that, which you know, God figured everything out, but if I'm discerning now, if I'm supposed to go into pro-life work, I'd say, no, I think I'm supposed to be like a local pro-life advocate or just share my experience. I don't think I'm being called back on the front lines. So for someone that's discerning, am I going to go out into the pro-life movement? I think it would be good to think what part of the pro-life movement am I supposed to be like going into? Because everyone's supposed to be a part of the pro-life movement. Sounds like you were called to that specific task for a season. Yeah. Great. Is there anything else that we haven't already discussed that you think that listeners should know? Um, oh my goodness, I'm blanking. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I guess the only thing that's coming to mind is one, I would highly recommend everyone to go through JFA's um, seminar. Uh, they have an online seminar called Love 3, and they break up their six-hour seminar into um, different segments. It could be weekly. It could be like four days of a week. Um, and it's so powerful. If you've ever felt like you don't know how to confront the pro the pro choice movement, you don't know how to confront people who disagree with you, or maybe you're just like really bad at like, or you have a hard time understanding people who disagree with you, mm-hmm. or you just want to brush up. It's just so powerful. The I would highly recommend that. And then to uh two I guess <laughs> um that the three essential skills that JFA um stands by are the three essential skills of like life and I think they are the stepping stone to healing our culture not just of, of abortion um but any and all sin I mean there are just three essential skills to love and that's asking questions with an open heart, listening to understand, and finding common ground when possible. That's what makes JFA so important. I think that's how Jesus did it too. So, <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here today. And um, we're, we're recording this in advance, and I think it will still be coming out in advance of uh, the pro-life conference that you and I will be panelists at together, the Diocese of Boise in this October. So anybody who's around uh, Idaho or wants to come visit, we will be speaking together in, in early October. Um, and I will leave some contact information in the show notes if anybody wants to reach out to Bella and get more information. Thank you so much for being here, Bella. Boris, thank you so much for having me.